Hi, and welcome to the Modern Persian Food Podcast. We are food bloggers, Bita Arabian and Bita Nazim Kelly, and we're here to share with you the rich flavors and fresh ingredients of Persian cooking and how to incorporate them into today's modern lifestyles. We're excited to introduce you to the flavors, tastes, and techniques we use, and also our own cultural stories and perspectives growing up in the U.S. in a Persian family. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 87 of Modern Persian Food Podcast. If you're new to our show, we're so glad to have you. Thank you for letting us have a little stop in your ears. I am Bita, and I'm joined by the other Bita, my co-host and partner, Bita Nazem Kelly. Hi, Bita June. Hi there. How's it going? Great. Today, we're going to talk about an old classic Persian dish called kotlet. Now, I have tons of memories of my grandmother making kotlet. And if you're Persian, you may have a memory as well. If you're not, we're so excited to tell you what it is. And we're going to talk about some modern versions that we've been experimenting with. In particular, Bita June has made a version with ground chicken. Mm -hmm. And I have made a plant-based sort of meatless version of my own. And so we're going to walk you through those. So there's typically two kinds of Persian kotlet. There's a potato version. And there's a meat and potato version. It's a fun little pan fried patty that's so delicious as a snack for lunch with a little rice or inside a little like pita bread sandwich is another way I like to have it. What's your favorite way to enjoy kotlet? I think typically the most common way of kotlet is actually with some sort of meat in it. Here today, we're kind of be pushing some of those boundaries. But when you think of a classic kotlet, it does have some sort of meat in it. It is typically oval in shape. And most often than not, it is pan fried. And I have to tell you that the smell of the kotlet cooking is like, unmistakable and it is so delicious and intoxicating that like anyone who kind of like comes by or smells that is like what is that it smells so delicious but you get like this crunchy exterior I like to sometimes think of it like kind of like a hash brown patty the meat is ground and I think there's different ways of making it sometimes with cooked potatoes or with raw potatoes I love it like on a picnic or something like that or as like a little portable food I love having it with like a little bit of lavash bread or some pita bread and definitely with like fresh herbs like it's my favorite way to have it maybe some radishes sliced up with it but yeah kwisla is like a favorite I don't think I've met someone who hasn't liked (laughs) kwisla Yeah, growing up, I used to love to eat it with ketchup. Mm -hmm. I still have to admit that I do like eating it that way. Yeah. But what is in a traditional kotlet would be grated up potato. Like you said, some people cook it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Some people use it raw. Grated onion. Mm -hmm. Delicious Persian spices, turmeric, saffron, salt and pepper. Mashed up with your hands and breadcrumbs to help it stick together. I know we've been playing with some recipes, so I thought today would be fun to share some of the ways that we've been trying to make it in our modern way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for me, kwisset was not something that I would really make on my own. It was something that I would typically have at my mom's house and she would make a big batch of it and I would take like some home with me and things. And so I never like really was kind of brave enough really to make a kwisset on my own. But recently, I've kind of become a little bit obsessed with it and I can't wait to like make it all the time now. And in this last week, I've made it two different times just because I I made it one time, I really loved it. And then I wanted to like just make a few tweaks to it and try it a different way, which I did. And I'm super excited about it. I also did the same thing. I made it in a certain way. I had some ideas in my mind. It was delicious. I'm sharing some with family. And Mm -hmm. just like you, I making it again, because it needed a little adjustment. There's something I wanted to add. But yeah, let's break it down. Tell me about the first and second time you made it this week. 
So the first time that I made it, and actually both times, I used ground chicken. I wanted to try something a little bit lighter. So I decided to go with chicken. I was in the grocery store and I was like, oh, let's try something a little bit different. So I used ground chicken. I used raw potatoes. I kept the skins on and I used a raw onion. And so I grated the potatoes and I grated the onion and I mixed it with the meat. I added salt, pepper, turmeric, and cumin. I didn't use any saffron in my recipe, but I just basically got those all together and I mixed it together and I made them into little patty shapes and I pan fried them. I was expecting to use a lot of oil, but I actually didn't really use oil and I'm not sure if it was like the type of, I was using like a copper type of pan, which is like nonstick, but I basically used like two tablespoons of oil and I cranked out like eight kotlet pieces. So I thought that that was actually pretty cool because I didn't actually use a lot of oil. You brown it on one side and then you flip it and then you brown it on the other side and then you're ready to go. When you take it off, if as if you were doing hash browns or other potato products, you kind of let it drain a little bit on a paper towel, but not too much. And I was ready to go and made a pretty little platter with some bread and herbs and things like that. The big difference that I tried in the second time was I wanted to try it actually in the oven. I basically made it pretty much the same way and I didn't use breadcrumbs. So it's actually, it ends up being gluten-free. And what I did was I mixed it up the same way and then I made the little oval shape and I put it on a sheet pan. I cooked it on the convection mode. So that means that the fan was on inside of the oven when it was cooking. And I basically cooked it for a total of about 35 minutes. I flipped it once throughout it and I didn't put any oil anywhere in it. And again, it was with chicken, so it was like low in fat anyway. And I was like so excited about that because it didn't have any mess. I wasn't like standing at the stove and trying to flip and making sure that oil doesn't splatter everywhere. And it was just super easy. Like I just made it and I put it in. I think the next time I do it, I may line my pan with parchment paper just to make sure it doesn't stick. But I did feel the same kind of techniques as when you're cooking other types of meats or like on a grill or something. It stuck a little bit until it was cooked. But once it was cooked, it released itself. So if you don't use parchment paper, just keep in mind that you just have to let it cook enough. It, when it's done cooking, that it automatically will like release from the pan. Or at least it did in my method of cooking it in the convection mode of my oven. But I loved it. It was so delicious. And I like was starving when it came out of the oven and I stood next to the oven and grabbed a bunch of fresh herbs and just like stood there and ate it standing up because it just smelled so delicious. And I was super hungry. So... I bet your version is so good. I can sit here and picture it and it's really close to the traditional ingredients. So I would imagine that it tastes very similar to what you were expecting. And how did your family like it? Yeah, so it did taste exactly the way that I was expecting. And I think that really getting kind of like the browning effect on both sides of the patty really helps that. And also with like the accoutrement that you eat it with, it was super satisfying and it was super delicious. My family loved it. My husband loved it. One of my kids tried it. The other one didn't, but he's kind of a little bit picky anyway. But my daughter really enjoyed it too. And I wrapped it up in some lavash bread and she ate that up. So that was a win for me. That's so good. And it's definitely one of those items that I'm going to incorporate into my normal menu planning. And I love having them around and I'll like have them for breakfast or like if I want to have just like a quicker, easy lunch or like I said, a perfect thing to take on a picnic if you're going to be going out, especially now that it's like kind of summertime and people are going out and enjoying time at the park. You can make a bunch of quitlet and share them with your friends and family. Absolutely. That's one of the things I love about what we're doing is that, you know, we had a lot of fun this week. We shared pictures with each other Mm -hmm. and inspired each other. And I know my husband was so psyched. It's just the two of us. We're empty nesters. Our girls are in college. But, you know, when I was going to take a pretty picture of it, so I did the full on spread Uh with the sabzi cordon and the radishes and the sliced tomatoes and the pickles and Yes, it was so good. It's not something that I normally make either. I think I've probably made it once or twice ever because I was spoiled with having my grandma make it. And it's kind of like meatballs Mm -hmm. as far as it's labor intensive. You do have to mash it with your hands and shape it and cook it. So like it's a process thing, but I have some tips too. Yeah, it is traditional to have some sort of pickles with it or something like a little salty and crunchy. So pickles, I used olives, you can use like capers or something like that to have like a little punch of acidity. Mm -hmm. Ooh, capers is a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to be just ketchup. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So tell us your tips. What'd you learn doing it? 
Sure. Yeah. So I went into it. I just thought like, let's just try to go all out healthy. What's like the healthiest way I can make it for the first stab at it. And then I could add some stuff back in if I missed mm-hmm. it. So that was sure. my approach. So y'all probably know about like impossible meat or beyond meat. I used a meat substitute that I had. I actually had a few patties left over from when we made burgers so I used that as the ground meat. So you crumbled it up? Yeah, I just crumbled it up, yeah. Uh-huh. For the potato, I didn't actually have potatoes that day, but I had Trader Joe's cauliflower pancakes. So those are kind of like your potato latke, but they are made with cauliflower. I'm like, well, I'll just defrost some of those. So I literally used like a half a pound of impossible meat or beyond meat. I used, I think, like three or four cauliflower pancakes that have been defrosted. Mm -hmm. Then I took half an onion. I started with the spices in the bowl. This is how I sometimes will do meatloaf or meatballs. Uh Just to make it really, really easy, I'll put like the spices on the bottom. And the spices that I used, I think I mentioned, I tried to keep it traditional to what my family did, Uh which was turmeric, saffron, salt, and pepper. I didn't use cumin. Then I grated the onion. A tip I have is to be sure when you're grating an onion on these patties is to drain the liquid. So when you grate an onion, there's going to be a bunch of water that comes out of it. Mm -hmm. I actually took the cutting board and I squeezed, not only did it drip all the water out, I like squeezed it out. I tried to get as much liquid as I could out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I just mashed it all together and then I added the egg. I put an egg in mine. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of helps bind it and hold it together. And then I shaped the ovals. Now, I thought about making it in the air fryer, but like you, I decided to use the convection mode on my oven, which is kind of what an air fryer is. Right. It's just a bigger space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I had more. So I did use parchment paper. I used a parchment paper lined baking sheet. And I put my shaped patties on there and I baked it in a 375 degree oven on convection mode. I did 10 minutes and now all ovens are different. So your heat time may be different. Check on it. Sure. But when I flipped it, it did get the browning effect that I remember seeing on them. So the aesthetic was there. And then I cooked it another 10 minutes. That's all it took on mine. I made mine pretty thin because I was worried (laughs) about it. I wanted it to kind of have a crispiness. Right. I'd say that mine were somewhere between a quarter to a half inch thick. So pretty Uh thin. Yeah. I guess I was totally experimenting. So I was thinking like, well, what am I going to do from here? They were done. We were hungry and we were so excited and we ate almost all of them. But I think that this next round, so in terms of the flavor for mine... I didn't so much miss the meat taste because I think that these Beyond Meats and Incredible Burgers taste a lot like meat to me. Uh-huh. I miss the potato. Yeah. Yeah. There that. was no reason. Honestly, I just didn't have it. I feel like there was no reason to do cauliflower in here when I was already substituting the meat. So I actually have some mixture left over. I get a little burnt when I'm making like meatballs or patties. Yeah, burnt out. Uh-huh. Especially it's just two of us. Yeah. So I saved some of the mixture and I'm going to add some ground potato this time. Mm-hmm. It was too many substitutions. So I'm going to put the potato back in. The other idea that I had as I was cooking it was I thought after the first 10 minutes, mm-hmm. it's gotten its shape. Yeah. And it's held together and it's looking nice. I might just take a pan with spray oil And do like a light fry. I might just experiment with that because I did miss the extra crispiness of the fry, of the deep fry. I ended up cooking mine a little bit longer than yours because I did want to have more of like the crunchy and crispy Mm -hmm. kind of coating on it. I went a little bit more than 15 minutes on the first side. And then after I flipped it, I cooked it like about 10 minutes. So I did go longer with the time on the first side of it. And I was able to kind of get that little crunch. Some other things that you could actually put in there. My mom actually makes a version where she uses a potato and then adds grated carrots to it as well. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I really love that. And I think that like my biggest barrier actually 
way to making this is the grating.、Mm-hmm. So if you have like a food processor or something that's like handy for you to just like throw your potatoes and onions in there, I think that it's much easier to make it. But you know, I didn't make big batches and I grated the potatoes and the onions myself, and <laughs> my arm was tired. Like it's it's very helpful to have like a device or something that can grate it for you. And I did want to actually note that you said that you drained the water and you squeezed the water out of the potatoes and the onions. I think it also maybe depends on what type of potato that you use. The first time I made it, I used russet potatoes, and it didn't really have a lot of liquid. But then when I made it the second time around, I used like the thin skin, more golden potatoes, and I really felt like I had to squeeze all the moisture out of it. So I think let's take a look at it, and if there's a lot of water, definitely make sure that you're squeezing all that excess water out. Yeah, and the reason we're doing that is because. You don't want it to be too wet and moist. You want it to hold together,、mm-hmm. and that leads into today's Ask the Beats, which comes from my hubby Bobby. Yay! So that's so fun that he's asking. But he said that he was always wondering how do you keep the cutlet from falling apart? What makes it stick together? So my family uses breadcrumbs. I know that's how my mom cooks her cutlet, and that's what. We use. I've even used breadcrumbs and burgers that I bake, and so for me,、uh-huh. it's a combination of using an egg, making sure you squeeze all the liquid out of it, and using enough breadcrumbs. And I'm used to、mm-hmm. the flavor of having those in there as well. What would you say? You put the breadcrumbs in the actual mixture, or you just coated the outside of it? Because I've seen it also some people have, like coat the outside of the patties with breadcrumbs, and then they pan fry it.、Hmm. No, I put it in the mixture. Yeah, I thankfully actually didn't have any issues with it falling apart. So I also think that when I made it in the oven, there was actually less chance of it falling apart, just because it wasn't like really moving, and it kind of like stayed in its own shape. And then by the time that I was ready to flip it, it had kind of like all cooked together and held its shape. So I would say that like if you want to kind of avoid it falling, that you might want to try making it in the oven the way that Bita and I did, and seeing if you have better luck that way. Well, this was fun. We hope we've made you hungry and motivated to eat some Persian cutlet. We hope you've enjoyed our modern. Versions and experiments with taking some substitutions and making it a bit lighter. And with that, just wanted to say thank you for joining us. Thank you, Vita. Yeah, thank you so much, Vita June. And also to our listeners, if you do try to make cutlet yourself, please tag us on social media or send us your pictures. We'd love to share it with the other listeners and to help motivate everyone to try making cutlet or other Persian foods on their own. So thanks again and have a great day. Great idea. Until next time. Bye. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Modern Persian Food Podcast with Bita and Bita. Thanks for spending time with us. If you've enjoyed what you heard today, consider telling a friend or giving us a good rating. You can subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcasting app, or find us online at modernpersianfood.com or on Instagram for the recipes and information we talked about today. We'd love to hear your thoughts and see you next time.